Hey there, welcome back to 42 Pursuit, I'm Gavin. I recently finished putting together this CNC machine from a bunch of different parts that I got from a bunch of different sources, and in this video I'm going to be going over what parts that I picked, why I picked them, and some of the design choices I made, and how they all integrate together and what I think about the machine as a whole. If that's something that you're interested in, stick around. Now the perceptive of you may have noticed that this machine looks very similar to the recently announced Elite Series machines by Onefinity. It just so happened that I picked all of the parts independently and after they'd come in and I'd started building the machine that Onefinity announced their Elite Series. There are a lot of similarities, there are a few differences, but if you have one of those machines on order or if you're in the market and are looking at those machines, this video will give you a good overview of what those machines are capable of as well. Now without further ado, let's get to it. When designing the frame, I had a couple constraints in mind. First of all, I wanted it to be big enough that if Onefinity ever came out with a frame that was a full four foot by four foot version, there would be enough room to upgrade into that guy. Lucky for me, while I was in the middle of this build, they announced that they will have an upgrade path available for upgrading these Y rails to the four, full four foot capacity. I also wanted there to be two levels so I could put a machine on the top level get jobs so that it could start paying for itself. And once this was kept busy, I could get a second machine and throw it on the lower level without having to take up an entirely new valuable footprint space in my shop, which I'm sure many of you can sympathize with. I also wanted the frame to be super rigid and so made it from two inch square tube steel with eighth inch wall thickness. According to my calculations, this should be sufficient for the kind of work that I wanna be doing on this, which includes running the machine pretty uh, pretty forcibly. So if welding a frame together intimidates you, maybe take this as an opportunity to learn a new skill. Welding is invaluable and it allows you to have a lot you know, thinner frame that might be stronger than wood or a bolt together option. And it's a great skill to add to your arsenal. I drilled holes everywhere a joint butts together so that wires can be routed through the inside of the frame to keep them from being as exposed on the outside. I also wanted the frame to be mobile, so I added casters in each of the corners, but I didn't want it to sit on the casters all the time, so I designed these leveling feet. So with a socket in your drill and an adapter, you can quickly zip these up and down to level out your machine and keep it from having all the weight on the wheels. Now the footprint of this frame is 74 inches wide by 65 inches deep, and there are four pieces of this tube steel running in the X direction across each level of the tables as well as two pieces on either end to hold it all together, four verticals, and then some cross bracing to make sure that this doesn't rack back and forth when you're pushing some velocity and acceleration on this guy. Next, let's talk about the CNC frame itself. As mentioned previously, this is the journeyman frame by Onefinity. The X rails are 50 millimeters in diameter, the Y rails are 35 millimeters in diameter, and I was fortunate enough to get one of the early versions of the stiffy rail for the X gantry. I don't know if this is super paramount, but any added rigidity is a good thing in my book. I've also added some little L brackets to hold on some pieces of cardboard for chip guards, because this tends to throw chips horizontally and to keep all of those from landing and sucking the oil away from the rails and the ball screws. I figured a little thin piece of cardboard would help and it makes cleanup a lot easier because it keeps everything a lot more centered. Now the stock Winfinity controller uses stall current sensing to detect when the axes run into the end stops. The Maso controller that I'm using doesn't have that option, so I picked up these proximity sense sensors for the Z, X, and then two on each Y, and I designed and 3D printed some brackets that will align the face of each sensor with a large piece of metal to sense off of when the machine is homed. Mounting that limit switch on the Z-axis was a little bit tricky, but I finally figured out a configuration that will actually sense off of this bearing when it raises up to its highest position. I added sensors to both of the Y rails, which allows the controller to auto-square the machine when it's going through the homing sequence. So if anything gets tweaked, you can hit home and it will square itself back up, which is super handy. The other thing that didn't come with a stock Onefinity frame are drag chains, and for the amount of wires that I had to route, that was definitely a necessity. I found some 3D printable bracket files that hold two pieces of angle aluminum, both for the X and for the Y, that printed real quick and easy and assembled quite seamlessly. Next up, we've got these stepper motors. Now I got these ones directly from Masso. They're three Newton meter closed loop steppers with integrated stepper drivers. That means they've got a ton of torque. If they 
aren't able to achieve the position that the controller told them to, they'll send an alarm signal back to the controller and let them know that they weren't able to get there, which can stop a job and keep a part from being scrapped. And because they have the integrated stepper driver, you don't need separate stepper drivers in your electronics enclosure, but you need to run an additional two wires to supply power to each stepper motor. Each stepper motor requires eight wires, two for power. These two wires are supplying 36 volts, four wires for your step and direction differential signals. This is a pair of double shielded twisted pairs, and then two more wires for your enable and alarm signals that feed back to the controller. These stepper motors are spec'd at a maximum input voltage for power of 36 volts. Now generally on stepper motors, the higher voltage you can push to them, the faster and more torquey they can be because it doesn't take them so long to charge the magnetic coils inside. I haven't noticed any issues with these. Running some tests, I was able to get consistent speeds of 500 inches a minute, velocity and then acceleration at 40 inches per second squared, which I think is pretty fair for this machine. Now this is one difference between my machine and the Elite Series. These are three Newton meter steppers from Maso. The ones spec'd out on the Elite Series machines from Onefinity are supposedly 1.2 Newton meter. So less torque, but running at 36 volts, you might be able to energize those circuits and uh, have pretty good acceleration velocity. I'm kind of curious to see what those values are on an Elite machine, but I know three Newton meter for this guy works pretty darn well. Now onto what is perhaps one of my favorite parts of this build, and that is this 2.2 kilowatt spindle. It has a 80 millimeter outer diameter, so you need to get a larger clamp if you go the Onefinity route. It has a working range from 8,000 to 24,000 RPM. It has up to a half inch collet size, so you can turn bigger bits. This is a half inch bit, and this can move material. Because of its diameter, you can do a lot deeper plunges. Um, I found the happy medium is these 3 8 bits with half inch collets. They're, uh, they're cheaper than the half inch bits, which I've got a couple of these that I'll use for special occasions, but they can really move material. You can do in most woods a 3 8 depth of cut on your roughing passes. And I have a map topography of a mountain range that I do quite commonly. This is the roughing pass done on my old machine, which had a quarter inch collet maximum. This would take 45 minutes for the roughing pass. And on this machine with the 3 8 bit, that same cut takes six minutes. So huge time savings. This thing can really move material. And you have the benefit of turning things like this, which is a two inch um, flattening bit. And huge time savings on that. Running the wasteboard flattening takes about six minutes on this machine <laughs> with this two inch flattener and this awesome spindle. This is a kit that I got from PWN CNC and I definitely recommend it. It comes with a spindle, comes with a really good shielded cable, which this throws off a lot of EMI energy that can mess up signals going back to your controller. So good cable, good connector, great spindle, good support, good warranty, and it comes with a pre-programmed variable frequency drive, as well as a cable that you can connect to your controller to the VFD, and that can control the RPM via G-code, so that will save you a step in your toolpath export. Highly recommend this. The 2.2 kilowatt spindle is definitely a game changer. It does run off of 240 volt wall power, so you have to have that accessible, but it doesn't require a lot of current, so you don't need a huge breaker to power your VFD, which in turn creates three phase and powers your spindle. With great power comes a great need for good dust collection. I picked up this Independent Z dust shoe from PWN CNC. This is their version nine. I like it for a few reasons. It collects the chips from the back, so it gives you good easy access from the front and good viewing. So if you wanna see what's happening or if you wanna film the action, you easily can do that. It's got this magnetic cover on the front, so it gives you easy access for bit changes as well. It's also a Z independent dust shoe, so you can adjust this to the height of your material, get optimal suction right where the cutter is, and, it stays in place while the spindle moves up and down, so it's always right where it needs to be. I did run into an issue that happens about 10% of the time, and that's when you're running really thick roughing passes and it's splintering out a bunch of wood that will tend to get caught in the back here, which because it has to go under, has to be minimal to kind of optimize that. So it's uh, not something that I think can be designed around. So I designed and 3D printed a front collection option, a four inch port that's really close to where the bit is and that can suck up those spears and splinters a lot easier. The other issue 
that I found is when you're cutting really thick wood, we're talking over two and a half inches, which I did run into on one um, anomaly job. This runs into the max capacity. So takes, I have to take this off and then drop this guy on. And then this can run a little bit higher. And then if it gets bumped up, it can just kind of slide up and down on the spindle there, which is convenient for the times that it's needed. The other thing that I like about this is it has a magnetic connection on the back. So it has these six magnets that connect to the port in the back. And then I added magnets onto my own design so that clicks on as well. And it's really handy because if any chips were missed, you can keep your dust collector on and suck those up super quick and easy as well. So highly recommend this one version nine from PWN CNC, and you can buy the assembled kits or get just the hardware kits and print your own. If you have a 3d printer, um, they have a couple different levels there, which is pretty handy depending on what you're looking for. Now let me take you on a quick tour around the corner to the electronics enclosure. We've got 240 volt power coming in, which only powers the VFD. And then we've got 120 volt, which powers everything else in the box. These connections have the twist lock Amphenol power connectors and they're of two different styles with different keying so they can't ever get swapped. And we've got where the fan sucks air in from down below and then ejects hot air out the top. These two switches control contactors inside the box that turn on the 240 volt power for the VFD and the 120 volt power for everything else. You can see the power coming in. We'll start with the 240 volt. This goes in to a contactor. And then when the switch is turned on, the contactor closes and connects power to the VFD. The VFD then has wires going out to the spindle connections, as well as wires going to the controller for controlling forward, reverse, and RPM. And the other thing I like about this VFD is it has an RJ45 Ethernet connector. So you can take the little user interface panel here and extend that to wherever you want. And I have it next to the controller so that I can see and confirm that I'm running the right RPMs. That is pretty much just this zone for the 240 volt power. We've got the 120 volt power coming in through a breaker that's going into a contactor and splitting off into these two switches. When these switches make the connection, it closes the contactor for the 240 volt or the 120 volt, which then energizes the rest of the box. 120 volt is localized to essentially this region. So it's powering these power supplies as well as this one. This power supply supplies 36 volts of power to all of the stepper motors. This supplies 12 volts of power to the fan and to anything else that I want to add later. I've got some ideas for things in the future. And then this 24 volt power supply supplies power to the controller, the limit switches, and anything else that runs off of the 24 volts. I've also added in an additional stepper driver. All of the other stepper motors are closed loop steppers with integrated drivers, but I've added one more to act as a stepper driver for a rotary axis that I want to add on later. I have its output going to this four pin connector so I can run those four wires to a rotary axis and unplug it and take it out of the way when not in use. I think that about covers it for the electronics enclosure. Now let's head up to the controller. Behold the G3 Masso touch controller. Now this is what makes all the magic happen. I did a ton of research on different controllers before landing on this one. And after putting it through the paces for the last few weeks, I'm very happy with my decision. Let me tell you about some of the features that I quite like on this unit. Because it's a dedicated piece of hardware, it doesn't require a separate computer to run, which means no monitor, no keyboard, no mouse, and its startup times are insanely fast. From when turning on power to when this is ready to go is about 13 seconds. While startup time isn't a deal breaker, it is a really nice convenience. The documentation on this unit is also phenomenal. The support is good, and there's a ton of YouTube videos out that dive into every aspect of this controller, setting it up and running it. It's got 24 inputs, 18 outputs, so you can pretty much connect whatever you want to it, whether it being a mist cooler, have it control blast gates, have it control your dust collection, have it control a vacuum system. It also has capabilities for adding an ATC, which is an automatic tool changer. I think that that is the next step in the evolution of this level of CNC's. I'm excited to have the option to explore that world with this controller as well. Because it's designed to work with closed loop steppers, it also has phenomenal error detection. So if the machine doesn't reach the position that it's supposed to, the controller knows and knows what to do. It shuts it off and can often save a piece. 
It also has the ability to save and resume from a specified line of code. So if the power goes out and you have to restart your machine, you can easily rehome it, re-zero out your Z, and hit resume from line, and it will remember which line it left off at and can resume from that line. You can also specify what line you want to start from if for some reason you want to start a job from the middle and know what line is the one you want to start from. It also has built-in Wi-Fi, so you can install an application on your computer that you can drag files to and hit send to controller. It will send it over Wi-Fi to your thumb drive. You also have the option of just unplugging your thumb drive, walking over to your computer, and dragging files over to that as well. The other piece of hardware that I got from Maso was their pendant. This isn't entirely necessary because the jog screen is very powerful. You have step mode and continuous mode and can adjust how fast and what step size you want. But this is super handy for setting a really precise zero point if you want, or for just jogging the machine around. It has your XYZ as well as additional axes if you have a rotary connected. You have 1x, 10x, and 100x resolution on the right side here. The knob is also extremely satisfying, so points for that. And with the highest resolution set, you can get down to less than a thousandth of movement resolution with this guy. It's also magnetic on the back, so you can stick it to any steel surface, and it's got a long enough cable that you can go to anywhere in your CNC machine and have a quick access <laughs> emergency stop button if you're worried about your job at all. Speaking of zeroing things out, you can use any generic touch corner plate and set this up in settings with whatever dimensions that happens to be, and it is very quick and efficient. I mostly use it to touch off my zero point for my z-axis, and I'll use the coordinate reference of the machine off of the home position as my typical zero zero when I set up projects. Overall, I don't think I could really be happier with this controller. The setup is incredibly easy. You have your machine settings, you have your inputs, your outputs. Those are super straightforward and easy to set up. You have your program page, so when you pull in a new toolpath, it will show up on this screen here, and then you have all of your run, stop, manual control, spindle control buttons there in the corner. Under jogging and probing, you have a really good jog around page, so you don't even need a pendant or a controller to move it around. This page is very easy to get right where you want really quickly. Under the tools and offset page, I haven't used this a ton because I don't have a tool changer or keep track of tools by tool number yet. But you also have work offsets, so if you have different regions of your work table that you have different jigs set up for different fixtures, for different jobs, it's super easy to set up different work zero points without having to set those every single job. Conversational tab gives you some options for setting up different wizards. If there's a task or a operation that you do commonly, you can set that up in here. And the last tab is where you load your files in. This side shows the folders and files on your thumb drive, and you can expand those and select what you want and choose to load those in, or you can even edit your G code from within this as well, which is super handy at times. Now enough of that, there's plenty of videos out there that show all of the details of all of the menus and all of the capabilities of this controller. Now some of you I'm sure are wondering what the controller looks like inside and how this is all wired together, so come a little closer and let me show you what's going on inside. In here we've got the G3 controller, a relay board, and then these connections here are all that connect to the touch screen as well as the emergency stop and the stop and start buttons on the front of the panel. Working through all the connections going around, these are the connections to the front panel. These red wires are the inputs for the alarm signals coming from the stepper motors. These are the inputs coming from the limit switches. We've got a power terminal block. This is our touch plate connection. We've got our input ground and 24 volt power coming from our electronics enclosure. This connector and cable go to the pendant. And then we've got our X, Y, Z rotary and slaved Y axis here. This wire going into the orange terminal block goes to the VFD and the controller through those wires can control the speed and direction of the spindle. And these wires connect to the enable pins on the closed loop steppers to enable their operation through the relay board. There's great documentation on the Maso website on how to connect everything and make sure everything's running as it should. Now, if you're gonna do a build like this, there's two things that I recommend. First of all, make sure that all of your wires are labeled. I got a label printer and heat shrink labels that fit inside of it so I can label all of my wires. All the wires in this are labeled on both ends, which makes troubleshooting way easier if there ever is an issue. My other tip is to get a set of ferrules of different sizes and the crimper and put one on the end of every single stranded wire. It helps keep things neat, tidy, and secure, and you're confident that none of the tiny little wires are escaping and bridging between different connections. As mentioned earlier, I moved a little user interface that's typically on the front of the VFD to here with an extension ethernet cable. It's nice to keep an eye on the RPM in case there was an error in programming, and instead of going 18,000 RPM, it's going 1800 RPM. Not that I've ever done anything like that. Wiring all this stuff up at first was a bit intimidating, 
but breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and doing one thing at a time and making sure that that's working, it all actually went together pretty quick and easy. At this point, I've put probably a couple dozen hours on this machine and I really don't have any complaints. Everything has either met or exceeded my expectations, so I'm pretty happy. I'm excited to see the cousins of this machine, the new Elite Series by Onefinity, getting released into the wild and to see everyone's thoughts on that machine. I think that the Maso controller and the closed loop steppers with the easy upgrade path to a 2.2 kilowatt spindle is gonna be a huge game changer for a lot of people and a lot of businesses. If there's anything that I glossed over too quickly or didn't cover, or if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. As always, stay curious and take care.